Welcome back everyone, it's Matsmas here once again with you. Thank you for joining me on this video today. We are here once again doing a naval ship review and what a behemoth this one is. Today guys we are talking about the fantastic USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 brand new aircraft carrier. It's the lead ship in the four class of aircraft carriers and today we're going to discuss its specifications, a bit of an overview and my own personal opinion on it. As always guys, please feel free to go check out my Patreon account. Any support there and donations are much appreciated and thank you in advance. As always, if you do wish to come and have a chat with me, I do have my Facebook link in the description below along with my Discord channel. So if you wish to suggest any future videos or any comments on this particular video or others, feel free to come and have a chat and uh, if you want to play some games, there's uh, that opportunity too. So let's talk about this fantastic ship then. So, the Gerald Ardford CVN-78 is the lead ship of her class of the United States Navy supercarriers. The first two ships, USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 and USS John Kennedy CVN-79, have been commissioned in 2016 and will also be commissioned in 2020 respectively, and further ships of this class will enter service at intervals of five years. A total of 10 Ford class carriers were planned and with construction continuing until 2058. The CVN-78 will replace the aging USS Enterprise CVN-65 which entered service in 1961 and will approach the end of its operational life by 2015. The total acquisition cost of the CVN-21 is expected to be $13.7 billion. The US Department of Defense awarded Northrop Grumman Newport News in Virginia a $1.3 billion contract in May 2004. The CVN's 78 first steel was cut in August 2005. A $5.1 billion contract for detailed design and construction was awarded to Newport News in September 2008. The keel was laid in November 2009. The CVN 78 aircraft carrier was installed with four 30-ton bronze propellers in October 2013. Both the launch and first voyage of the ship took place in November 2013. Anchor testing aboard the carrier was completed in June 2014, while the US Navy conducted emails testing on the CVN-78 in May 2015. Northrop Grumman was awarded a planning and design contract for a second carrier, CVN-79, in November 2006. In May 2011, the US Navy announced that the carrier would be called John F. Kennedy. Construction of the USS John F. Kennedy CVN-79 began in February 2011 and is expected to be completed in 2020. The Gerald R. Ford class carriers will have the same displacement at about 100,000 tons as its predecessor, the Nimitz class George H. W. Bush CVN-77, but will have between 500 and 900 fewer crew members. The manpower reduction was a key performance parameter added to the original four outlined designs in 2000 in an operational requirements document for the CVN-21 program. So basically guys, it means that the less crew members that this ship has to support, the more combat effective it'll be, because really the less people we have to look after, the more hands that can actually be focused actually on fighting the battle itself. It is estimated that the new carrier technologies will lead to a 30% reduction in maintenance requirements and a further crew workload reduction will be achieved through higher levels of automation. Basically it means guys a lot of systems on board the ship are actually going to be automated whether it be transporting of weapon systems, uh, ammunition to the decks, flight crew, all that sort of stuff and it's going to be a lot more automated which reduces a lot of hardships on the crew members themselves and to be honest the less ship members that need to be away from, from land is good because we don't want to take troops uh, slash sailors away from their families and friends when they can be, you know, rotating on the ship in a, in a lower crew number, which is, to me, I think a fantastic thing for, for the US Navy. The other main differences in operational performance compared with the Nimitz class are increased sortie rates at 160 sorties a day compared with 140 a day, a weight and stability allowance over the 50-year operational service life of this ship. There's also the increased approximately 150% electronic power generation and distribution to sustain the ship's advanced technology systems. Another key performance requirement is its inoperability. Since the 1960s, all US Navy aircraft carriers have been built at Northrop Grumman Newport News. Northrop has extended its design and shipbuilding facilities with a new heavy plate workshop and burners, a new 5,000 ton thick plate press covered assembly facilities and a new 1,050 ton capacity crane. 
Northrop is using a suite of computer-aided design or CAD tools for the CVN21 program, including a CATIA software suite for simulation of the production processes and a CAVE virtual environment package. What this basically means, guys, is they made a virtual reality version of this ship and designed it using computer-aided design to allow them to design this ship as if they're actually walking through it, which is absolutely incredible. The hull design is similar to that of the current Nimitz-class carriers and with the same number of decks. The island is smaller and moved further towards the aft of the ship. The island has a composite mass with a planar radar array, a volume search radar operating at S-band and a multifunctional radar at X-band, and also carries a stern-facing joint precision approach and landing system known as the J-PALS, which is based on the local area differential global positioning system GPS rather than radar. The aircraft carrier traditionally carries the flag officer and 70 staff of the carrier battle group. The flag bridge, which was previously accommodated in the carrier's island, was relocated to a lower deck in order to minimize the size of the island. The ship's internal configuration and flight deck designs have significantly changed. The lower decks incorporate a flexible, rapidly reconfigurable layout allowing for different layouts and installation of new equipment in command, planning and administration areas. The requirement to build an in-weight and stability allowance will accommodate the added weight of the new systems that will be installed over the 50-year operational life of the ship, including upgrades. The removal of one aircraft elevator unit and reducing the number of hangar bays from 3 to 2 have contributed to a weight reduction of the CVN-21 drastically. As with any aircraft carrier, it is normally escorted by its own ships to protect it, along with its first line of defense of aircraft. However, the ship is accompanied with weapon systems. The carrier will be armed with Raytheon Evolved Sea Sparrow missiles, or ESSMs, which defend against high-speed, highly maneuverable anti-ship missiles. The close-in weapon system is the Rolling Airframe Missile, otherwise known as RAM, from Raytheon. The ship currently has two RIM 162 Evolved Sea Sparrow missiles, medium range anti aircraft missile launchers, two RIM 116 RAM rolling airframe missile launchers, two 20mm Phalanx CIWS close in weapon system guns, and four 12.7mm Browning N2 machine guns. The ship also hosts a whole range of sensors. Raytheon was contracted in October 2008 to supply a version of the Dual Band Radar, or DBR developed for the Zolmwalt class destroyer for installation on the Gerald R. Ford. DBR combines X-band and S-band phased arrays. As with any aircraft carrier, these things take a lot of power to get moving, and to do so, the ship is provided with two A1 Bravo series nuclear reactors of unknown output driving power to four huge shafts. The surface speed of this craft is around 30 knots, or 35 miles per hour, and the operational range is obviously pretty much unlimited to the power of the reactors. The carrier will be capable of carrying up to 90 aircraft, including the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-18E and F Super Hornets, the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye, the E-18G Growler Electronic Attack Aircraft, the MH-60R and S Helicopters, and unmanned air vehicles and unmanned combat air vehicles. Other related projects that go along with this is obviously the beautiful F-35 Lightning II, which is being developed for both the United States Air Force, the Navy, Marine Corps, and the UK Royal Navy, which is an important part of this aircraft carrier because really it is specifically being designed to be able to utilize this aircraft. The requirement for a higher sortie rate at 160 sorties a day with surges to a maximum of 220 sorties a day in times of crisis and intense warfare activity has led to design changes in the flight deck. The flight deck has relocated a smaller island and there are three rather than four deck edge elevators. Deck extensions also increase the aircraft's parking areas. The aircraft service stations are therefore located to the rear and 18 refueling and rearming stops are available. General Atomics was awarded the contract to develop the EMALS, or the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, which uses a linear electromagnetic accelerator motor. EMALS demonstrators were tested at the Naval Air Systems Command, or NASC, Lakehurst Test Center in New Jersey. It is planned that EMALS will replace the current C-13 steam catapults currently used on aircraft carriers of the United States Navy. As you can see from this beautiful footage, the EMALS technology is doing very, very well. Being able to launch such a heavy vehicle like this off the edge of the ship is proving to be very, very effective, and as you can see, it's probably going to work very, very well for an aircraft. 
The EMAIL's technology offers the potential benefit of finer aircraft acceleration control, which leads to lower stresses in the aircraft and pilots, and provides a slower launch speed for unmanned air vehicles, which also allows for a wider window of wind over deck speed required to launch the sequence. The contract for the development of an advanced turbo-electric arrestor gear has also been awarded to General Atomics. The electromagnetic motor applies control to the synthetic arrestor cable to reduce the maximum tensions in the cable and reduce the peak load on the arrestor hook and aircraft fuselage. As you can see from this footage of them launching this beast off the edge of the ship, it's proving to do a job very, very well. I must admit, I would love to just be able to sit on this thing and fly off it if I didn't get hurt. It'd probably be like one of the most fun rides of the world, but uh, clearly I'd, I'd actually die if I went off that thing, but still it'd be the ride of my life. For aircraft weapons loading, the flow of weapons to the aircraft stops on the flight deck was upgraded to accommodate the higher sortie rates. The ship carries stores of missiles and cannon rounds for fighter aircraft, bombs and air-to-surface missiles for striker aircraft, torpedoes and depth charges for anti-submarine warfare aircraft. Weapons elevators take the weapon systems from the magazines to the weapons handling and weapons assembly areas on the level 2 deck, below the flight deck. And express weapons elevators are installed between handling and assembly areas with the flight deck. The two companies selected by Northrop Grumman to generate designs for the advanced weapons elevators are the Federal Equipment Company and Oldenburg Lakeshore Incorporated. Once again guys, this touches on the automatic weapon system bays that can actually deliver ammunition to the deck automatically without having the use of more crew members. Interestingly enough, the US Navy outlined a requirement for a minimum of a 150% increase in electrical power generation capacity for this aircraft carrier compared to its previous Nimitz class carriers. The increased power capacity is needed for the four electromagnetic aircraft carrier launches, but also for the future systems such as the directed energy weapon system that might be feasible during the carrier's 50 year lifespan. Basically guys, rail guns. As of May 2017, the USS Gerald Ford has completed her acceptance sea trials in a major step towards becoming a commissioned vessel in the United States Navy. The trials completed on May 28th, 2017. So there you have it guys, the beautiful USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78 and what a behemoth this thing is. I mean yes, aircraft carriers are inherently very very large, but this one for some reason just seems like an absolute mammoth when it compares to some of the older aircraft carriers, even though really it just doesn't. I love the fact that they've stepped away from some of the more traditional launching systems of launching aircraft off the aircraft carrier and trying to upgrade the ship to make it as efficient and productive as possible whether it be from manpower to actually being able to utilize systems that are a lot more reliable than say the steam system and reducing things being lean and, and working in a aviation industry and a manufacturing industry this is basically very similar to an aircraft carrier because at the end of the day it's about production producing sorties producing a number of combat aircraft that can get off the deck very very quickly fully armed and be able to go into an engagement combat ready. That's all this ship is designed to do. Get aircraft off combat ready as quickly and effectively as possible. And that means trimming the fat, cutting waste and making sure the aircraft is able to, you know, compete uh, with its adversaries very, very quickly and being able to provide the Navy with its protection of both air and ground support. Now, I must admit, seeing a ship like this with its, you know, guts hanging all over the place, it really does go to show the effect and that it takes to actually build one of these things. I mean, the, the logistical demand of building this kind of ship, I can't even imagine the kind of effort and manpower that goes into something like that. And it's just incredible to see. I must admit, I really do enjoy watching that time-lapse video of it being put together. It's just, it's astonishing. It's the size of an item like this that's put together, the, the kind of workmanship that goes into that is just very, very impressive. I have to admit, I do really look forward to seeing this aircraft carrier utilizing the F-35 in all of its glory. It seems like it's primed and ready for that aircraft to work wholeheartedly on the ship, and that's pretty much very applicable to the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier of the UK Royal Navy, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that ship come out in production as well. Overall though guys, this aircraft carrier clearly is going to be a power horse of the United States Navy and something that clearly needs to be able to be ready to fulfill the needs of the aircraft carriers of the US Navy for many years to come. A 50 year life cycle is clearly going to be able to provide that support for many generations. I was shocked to see that number. 50 years is a long time guys for a ship to be at sea 
And yes, many ships that are already serving right now have served that long, but you've got to think, the ships that are being placed out at sea nowadays are going through just as much rigorous uh, ship activity than they are, you know, 10, 20 years ago. The operational deployments are being increased, the ability for these ships having to be deployed around the world is increasing. We have multiple conflicts, multiple scenarios going on around the world, so this ship is really going to get put through its paces. I'm also, as I said before, looking forward to see how the F-35 program works in being able to get those sorties out very, very quickly and provide that combat support. I'm also highly intrigued to see how they're going to put the whole railgun system on these ships if they ever think about doing it. Um, and also the fact that the ship is actually reducing its crew members. Now that may be a little bit of a side thing that you can kind of put in the back of your mind, but honestly to me personally, I think that's fantastic. The US Navy is not only thinking a little bit about cost reduction and lean principles and reducing the manpower effect of the ship, but it's also allowing sailors not having to leave home and being able to stay on dry land uh, without having to deploy and staying away from their family and loved ones and you know the risk is always there of conflict uh, coming apart and I would say that being on a ship away from home is, is something that I'm not sure every sailor uh, wants to stay on for long periods of time and reducing that manpower on the ship is, is negating the fact to need more sailors to deploy. That to me is a big deal and because I've deployed myself away from my family and friends, I think that's a rather big deal to me and, and I know it's not really what their key concern was, it's to try and streamline the ship, but it's something to think about, you know, it really does try and take into an effect that they're trying to, to help reduce the workload of the US Navy and that to me means quite a lot. It's an exciting world for the aircraft carriers around the world with both the US, USS Ford and the UK's Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier, which I will be doing a video on in the future. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please leave me a comment. If I made any mistakes, I apologize and feel free to correct me. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please feel free to do so and hit that like button. Have a wonderful day and thanks again. Bye-bye.